Hello everyone and welcome to British Murders, the podcast that focuses exclusively on British murder cases with an occasional glimpse at horror movies. I'm your host Stuart Blues and this week I am joined by an incredibly special guest. He is a forensic pathologist who has performed over 23,000 post-mortem examinations in his career, including some of the most high-profile cases of recent times. You might recognize him from several true crime documentaries, including Autopsy, The Last Hours of, Death Detective, and Real Crime. He's also a best-selling author, an experienced senior lecturer and professor, an avid apiarist, I hope I'm saying that right, and an avid aviator who has held his private pilot license since 2004. He is jack of all trades, master of, I'm sure, more than one. Please welcome to the show, Dr. Richard Shepard. Hello, Stuart. How nice of you to invite me to join you. Oh, you're more than welcome. It took me a fair while to go through your whole website to get every facet of your achievements, your accomplishments, your hobbies, your career. You've got quite a lot of plates spinning there from what I could see. Well, yes, but retirement, fortunately, I'm not having to spin quite as many, so I can enjoy the apiary and aviation a little bit more. We will come to those later because I was fascinated to find out that you're intrigued in both of those things on your website. What we are going to do before we get into the nitty gritty of your background, your career, as it were, is we're going to break the ice a little bit with like a theological question, I like to say. What I'd like to know, in your opinion, what do you think happens to us as humans after we die? Ooh. Now, <laughs> okay, so we're starting with the easy questions then. Stuart, That's it. Are we? It gets harder uh, from here. <laughs> right. I don't know is the answer to that. I have no strong religious convictions, not attached to any particular religion, but I'm always struck by the fact that religion is such a powerful force throughout the world and throughout all communities. I enjoy the um, conventions of Church of England services. But when someone dies, I've seen 23,000 odd people who have died. And each time I've wondered, I wonder where they are now. Uh, a very good friend of mine, uh, Sue Black, the anthropologist, said that, you know, she wants to be awake when she dies because she thinks it's going to be the next huge adventure. And I think I'm going to buy into that. I don't know where we go, but when it happens, it's going to be such an adventure. Do you think there's a fear of there being nothing? Because in my opinion, I'm not religious at all. I wouldn't necessarily say I'm an atheist. I'm more agnostic. I, I, I'll believe it when I see it kind of thing. Yeah. But do you think religion as a whole, it goes back thousands of years, of course, has been fabricated by humans because of that fear of the potential of being nothing after death? Gosh, I, I, I simply don't know. But what I do know is every night I climb into bed and I shut my eyes and I go to sleep. Whether I wake up in the morning is a different matter. But that transition from awake to asleep isn't scary, isn't distressing, isn't unpleasant. Uh, and I assume, I hope, having witnessed it when I was working as a clinical doctor and seen so many people in so many circumstances who have died, I hope that the transition, howsoever it actually is caused, and I've seen people dying after accidents, I've seen people dying of cancer, I've seen people dying of heart disease, all sorts of things. The transition always seems to be fundamentally at the end, a quiet moving on. Uh, and I hope that that is what's going to happen. Whether there's anything after, as I say, I simply don't know, but if, if I go and find out, I'll, I'll come back and join you again uh, <laughs> over some sort of sub-Ethernet uh, and let you know. If you do have the secrets to what happens next, I think this is the show to spill the beans. <laughs> You're definitely top of the list, Stuart. <laughs> Excellent. So let's have a, a discussion about, well, your background, really, your early life. You went on to be a forensic pathologist, as lots of other things will come on to. As a kid, though, what were your aspirations? What did you want to be? Initially, I knew that I wanted to study sciences. So I'm sort of looking back now to the start of my secondary education. The sciences were what interested me, probably because they what I felt I could do. Languages were always a struggle. Uh, mathematics, I could just about struggle with. But the sciences are what interested me. Uh, and then there was one day at school when I was about 13 or 14, 
a friend of mine brought a forensic textbook that he'd stolen off the shelf. His father was a GP and it must have been one of his dad's textbooks when he was at uh, university. Anyway, he brought it in, a book full of pictures of murders and wounds and injuries and deaths. Uh, and most of my friends in my class were quite disgusted by this, but I was completely fascinated by this insight into a world that I simply didn't know existed and that there were doctors who would help the police solve crimes and convict the guilty. And that was me sold. That then set my life up through O-levels, as they were then GCSEs and A-levels and university, to go on to become a forensic pathologist. So what areas of study did you choose at college and uni? Well, sciences, so maths, maths, physics, chemistry. Uh, we, we did a, a peculiar joint maths and physics uh, A-level, and I, I can't quite remember what it was, but it was a sort of a, a mixture of the two that scored two A-level points. And then from there, straight into university to study medicine. Uh, I should say for those those that are might listen to this, in their revision period up to A-levels, I got into medical school on two C's, a D and an E, and I don't think you can do that anymore. But that <laughs> might say more about my educational abilities and my ability to duck the system than anything else. <laughs> I mean, you, you did all right considering those grades, didn't you? Well, yes. I mean, I, I would say there's massive grade inflation, but I have to be careful because I ha now have nieces and nephews who are A, taller than me and B, doing their A levels <laughs> at the moment. But yeah, I mean, it is interesting. I think, you know, these are markers for educational achievements. I know lots of people who didn't achieve uh, as well as I, who are now masters of science and commerce and uh whatever so it's it's a marker in life and i don't think anyone should feel that it is the be all and end all i was lucky i slipped through but uh, and achieved what i wanted to but i don't think anyone should be disheartened if they don't get straight a pluses every time they sit an exam do you think there's too much emphasis on achieving good grades and finishing school i do think so i mean it, it seems to me now that schools are focused on getting the grades and passing the exams rather than on education. Uh, and it's difficult because I'm now officially in the old codger class, but it does seem to me that there's little about things peripheral, music and art and literature and learning about science for the fun of it rather than just to pass an exam. So I, I think there's always that risk. Uh, perhaps the educationalists will tell me I'm wrong, but uh, as I say, looking my children are now well past this stage, but my nieces and nephews are in it. And I do wonder, I have to say. It's a good point regarding learning to pass an exam rather than learning something for the fun of it, for the enjoyment, for potentially a career. I think there's a distinct lack. You'll know more about the current system than I, I imagine, but a lack of stuff involving life skills, you know, to do with finance how to run a home how to look yeah. after children all that kind of stuff it, it, i've never used in my opinion pythagoras's theorem to this day and i work for a bank <laughs> so that says a lot about we were always promised that you will have a calculator in your pocket when you're older well actually we do yeah, well that, that's right that's uh, my bank account is never the sum of the squares it's always the sum of the debits sum <laughs> <laughs> exactly so so you got college went to university started studying medicine Qualified, I believe, 1977, I found yes. on an article. Gosh, that's a long time ago, isn't it? 1977. It is. Goodness me. Not to rub it in, but that is that is a while ago, Richard. Yeah, well, you're, you're the mathematician, so I'll leave you. <laughs> All I know is it was before I was born. Not to rub it in. <laughs> yeah, yeah, this... <laughs> so you, you did your training at St. George's Hospital, which yes, is at right. Hyde Park Corner. So what, was your, what did your training consist of? Well, it was the standard clinical medical training. You, we, we spend... Now it's two years, then it was 18 months learning about the sciences, about biochemistry and physiology, all the laboratory stuff. And then you go off and you start in your clinical training, which I did at Hyde Park Corner, you start seeing patients uh, and talking to them and diagnosing their diseases and learning how to treat them. So that it was it was that it was a wonderful hospital because it was small. Um, there were only, I think, less than 100 students in all three clinical years. So it was really nice. Uh, at that point. And so lots to see, lots to do, lots to learn. 
nice consultants. Uh, you know, it was it was a great time of my life, and I was I used to live at Number One Knightsbridge. So what could be wrong with that? Not bad. That's a bit of a flex. Yeah, that is great. <laughs> So you, is that sort of train you mentioned you were actually, you started off as a GP, is that right? No, no, uh, the, the training the training goes through, and uh, you learn about everything, you do all your final exams, uh, and then you go off and you become uh, a houseman. Uh, now, we did one year, and I spent a year working in medicine, which is respiratory medicine, cardiac medicine, diabetes, things of that sort, and then six months of that was done learning to do surgery, the second half. I knew I was always going to progress as quickly as I could to pathology because that's the, the step of the training I needed to get into. There wasn't a post immediately, so I went off and delivered babies for three months, which was great fun. Wow! And then as soon as a pathology training post became available, I s slid into that uh, and started my career learning to be a pathologist and then a forensic pathologist. How long's the training to become a pathologist? Well, all branches of medicine, give or take, it's about five years you commit to, whether you're going to become a GP or a radiologist or a forensic pathologist. I took a little longer, um, not quite sure why, a uh, couple of hiccups with a couple of exams en route. So I took about sort of six and a half years to get all my training completed. So I, I think I did work it out once from between walking through the door at medical school on my first day to walking out as a doctor was about 14 or 15 years. Okay. Lots of experience gained throughout that time. Though. Yes. I mean, and that's, that hopefully is what you expect from your doctor <laughs> when he's, <laughs> they're qualified. They, they know quite a lot and they've had the experience and can use it. So that's, it's, it's not unusual. It's not special. It's just the way the systems work wherever you go in medicine. You got your postgraduate training was completed in 1987. That's right. So that we're getting closer to when I was born. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Spoiler alert, that was 1989. And then it said you, you joined what was then, which indicates it's changed now, the elite forensic department at Guy's Hospital. Yes. Yeah, so, that's right. So what, what does that consist of? What's the elite forensic department? Well, the, there were forensic departments in all of the medical schools in London at that time. But the forensic department at Guy was run by a man called Ian West, who was young, very dynamic, very actively involved in lots of different spheres of forensic medicine. And that department was just at that time, uh, you know, the, sort of the up and coming dynamic department with lots going on work because it was dynamic, was coming into the department, investigating murders all over the UK and all over the world, really. So it was a great place to start my career. And Ian was a fantastic teacher. Do you remember your first examination, as in the first one that you led? Yes. <laughs> well, in a sense, there's two. One was in my training, my, the first post-mortem I ever did was a way, way back before I got this job at Guy's. This was way, soon after I'd stopped delivering babies. I, I went off to do this work at my training in pathology at St. George's. Now that was really, having watched lots of post-mortems, you know, to do, my, do one myself was really quite scary to do it for the first time to put a scalpel on a human and do that sort of examination was quite a step forward. But also for me, I knew that I, in a sense, I had to be able to do it because this was my career path. And if I couldn't do it, then my career path was going to have to make a radical change. So I was didn't sleep much the night before, spent a lot of time reading, examining, understanding, and with the help of my colleagues at the time, got through a post-mortem on someone who died a perfectly natural death. There was nothing unusual or suspicious about it. So that's the first time I ever did a case like that. And the first homicide case uh, that I dealt with, I can remember as well, which was a man who'd been beaten to death in a block of flats up in North London with an ashtray. Wow. So is it a case of every death has a post-mortem then? It's not just ones that are suspicious or in regard in a murder case? No, I, I think it's well, well less than 50% of cases, well less than 50% of cases. Most of the time, doctors know why their patients have died uh, and they will complete and sign a death certificate detailing a natural cause of death and that's as far then as the law is concerned. The law in the shape of Her Majesty's Coroner becomes 
certainly in England and Wales, it's it's different north of the border. The same similar process, but the person there is called the procurator fiscal. But England and Wales, there's a coroner covering every part of the United Kingdom. Uh, and if the death isn't natural, it's been due to an accident, or uh, it's been due to a possible murder, or it's suspicious, or the GP or the doctor treating the person doesn't know why they've died, then the coroner may ask for a post-mortem to be performed. And there's two levels. One is what we would call routine. I mean, it's never a death is never routine for the family. But for us, these cases were without suspicion. A full examination is performed by a qualified pathologist, not a forensic pathologist. And hopefully the cause of death is established either then or as a result of maybe toxicology, looking for drugs or something of that sort. But there's no suggestion that anyone else has caused the death. And then there are the more suspicious deaths that are dealt with by the home office pathologist, the forensic pathologist, where there is a suspicion that someone else may have been involved either directly or indirectly with the death. And there's sort of different gradations and skills needed for both examinations. Can a family request a postmortem if they're not happy with the diagnosis? Um, if they're not happy with the clinical diagnosis or, or the, the diagnosis of the first postmortem, do you see what I mean? Yeah. So let, let's say, for example, a relative dies. Yeah. The doctor's happy that it's not suspicious. They've put the, the cause of death as whatever it may be in their opinion. The family's thinking, mm, I'm not happy with that. I think there's some foul play there in that circumstance, let's say. Yes, there's two routes they can take. Hopefully they can make their views clear to the coroner uh, and the coroner would pick up on their concerns and he or she would then take over the case and order a post-mortem examination. Sometimes, though, the coroner will say, no, I'm quite content that the doctor is correct. I'm not going to do this. And, and then sometimes a family can ask for a post-mortem to be performed privately and they would have to approach a solicitor and the solicitor would have to approach a pathologist to, to get that done. There's no immediate way of doing it if the coroner refuses. But coroners will normally listen to what people's concerns and if they're reasonable concerns, then they will normally order a postmortem paid for by the state and organised by them. What's the protocol around a postmortem? And is it different for a more natural, less suspicious death versus, say, a murder? Oh, yes. Different people will perform the examination. So when it's a, a potential murder, and we, we use the term suspicious death. So, you know, sometimes they turn out to be entirely natural. Sometimes they don't, but that's the term we use. If it's a suspicious death and what's called a home office pathologist performs examination, these are people with additional training, additional skills, and to be honest, additional layers of suspicion. You know, we, we're trained to, to doubt, to be able to collect evidence, to worry, uh, and we've seen many more different types of cases than the hospital pathologist who would perform the post-mortem when it's probably a natural death, but not no one's quite sure what, someone's died suddenly, or maybe a road traffic accident, or maybe a drug overdose, or maybe a suicide. They will deal with the vast majority of those natural and unnatural deaths that aren't suspicious. But there are different layers of skill, different layers of knowledge, and different layers of experience. And sometimes cases will slip through when the, the, there is no suspicion expressed by the police or the coroner. Cases may be called natural. Uh, when in fact, further examination, perhaps at a later point by a home office pathologist, will establish that there, there are worrying features, things that uh, the first pathologist didn't appreciate were significant. So when you're going through an examination, and the, so the, the bodies come in and they've said, this is why we think the death has occurred, or this is basically what's happened, we just need confirmation of it. Yeah. Do you hone in on what that potential theory is, or do you have a fresh checklist from A to Z? This is the routine. We'll look at this first, we'll look at this second, and then if we get to that, we get to that. Or do you just focus on that one aspect of it? No, I, I think we, as I said, we are, we are, I think we must be born suspicious. Uh, you know, <laughs> we hear all, see all, uh, and say now, I think is the, the expression that we, we listen to everything we're told. 
of course we do, because the, the police are investigating it, the coroner's officers are investigating it, they're, they're trying to get as much evidence as they can to feed into us. But you know, if, if someone tells me something, I will make a note of it and I will be aware of it, but I will approach every case with an open mind and look at it in a structured way. And normally it's a pretty prepared format that we deal with it simply because that is the easiest and the best way of doing post-mortem examinations and it covers everything it really does cover everything so somebody might say to me oh he's been stabbed in the chest fine okay well I'll, I'll certainly look at any stab wounds I find on the chest and decide what's going on but I will also look at the brain and I'll also look at the feet and I'll also look at the the toenails and I'll also look at the, the back passage to see whether anything else has been going on so all of these things are part of our examination Although some people might say, well, what are you bothering to look at that for? He's obviously been stabbed. The answer is we look at everything. We always look, examine and document everything in every case. What's the average length of time it takes to complete one? Uh, it, it's very, it's very, very difficult because it, if someone, someone has 30 stab wounds, it makes it a very long post-mortem examination because each one has to be measured documented, photographed, the track of the wound has to be explored and examined. So they can be very long. But generally speaking, they are going to be in the region of five to six hours. It's a full full day's work to perform even the most straightforward examination. This is to say, we look at everything. Even if it's said to be straightforward, you never can tell. Do you do it alone or do you have assistance with you or...? Well, I'll have my the mortuary staff, the anatomical pathology technicians will be there. Usually one or two will be assisting. Then I'll have a police photographer who will obviously be taking photographs uh, as as and when I request them of the, the injuries and document them on a camera, digital images now. Uh, we'll also have an exhibits officer to whom if I take a sample of hair or toenails or I take a swab, I hand it to them and they will then process it properly and correctly to keep the evidence neat and clean and tidy. Uh, there's usually also an investigating officer present as well and maybe one or two, two others. So I'm part of a team and although when I'm in the mortuary, perhaps, perhaps I'm the one that is running it, uh, I'm also there listening because these people have immense experience too. And they're also, while we're working, they will still be receiving extra information that they'll be feeding back to me that I will be building into my understanding of the events surrounding that person's death. So we're working as a team. Um, you know, when we go elsewhere, if we go to the police station, then the police are in the driving seat. When we go to the laboratory looking for toxicology, the toxicologists are in the driving seat. But where I'm doing my examination, of course, I tend to be the one that's running the show at that point, but listening. To what other people are saying okay are you able to give me a high level overview of the the steps you would take from so the body's on the on the slab or whatever you call it forgive me if the terminology is <laughs> wrong we prefer table table then okay <laughs> yes, so the body's at the table from the first incision on a high level, obviously, it's five hours. We don't have time to go through every little step you would go through and document. But what order would you go through things typically in a post-mortem? Right. A post-mortem, generally, unless there's a reason to alter this, incisions will be made uh, and the skin will be reflected. That is, it will be dissected off the chest wall uh, and off the abdomen all the time looking for injuries, looking for abnormalities, looking for diseases. Then the front of the chest wall will be cut through, removing the sternum, the breast, the breastbone, and that will expose then the lungs and the heart underneath. We'll be looking at the neck uh, from the tongue through the upper airways and the esophagus past the larynx, obviously looking to see whether someone's been strangled or injured in the neck the airways down into the lungs, the main blood vessels and the heart in the body down into the abdomen, stomach, have they been poisoned? We'll take a sample of that. We'll look at the liver, given that alcohol is a very common associated finding uh, in uh, murders, both in the victims and in the assailants. Look at the bowel, 
look at the kidneys, look at all of the organs in the abdomen, and all of those organs are taken out of the body and examined carefully in detail, and samples are taken for toxicology, samples are taken to look at under the microscope, and say at every stage we are looking at and considering the possibility of injury and of disease. And I often say pathology is quite significantly uh, a process of feel as well as look. Um, you know, and quite often I will sense as I'm examining these organs that there's a lump or a bump or an absence or something that's strange because I've done, I, my my fingers tell me an awful lot and can sometimes lead the investigation. Once we've done that, we will then look at the head, we'll look for injuries, the scalp is then uh, reflected, taken off, folded back from the skull, the skull's cut through and the brain is removed. Uh, and examined once again, looking for evidence of bleeding, of injuries, skull fractures, damage, natural disease to the brain. And all this is done. I mean, the, when I describe it, even at that, this high level, it sounds awfully destructive, but it's not. It's done with care and, and with concern as well, but in a, such a way that the body can actually be put back together so that the relatives can view it without necessarily being confronted by the evidence of the incisions that I have made. And all of the organs are returned to the body. If for any reason we keep any for further tests, then the families are always informed what organs, what tissues we've retained. So it's done with great care and concern so that the families are not distressed when they come, hopefully, to view their relative. How accurately do TV shows and movies represent the process? Uh, I did a little, a little thing for my publisher, Penguin, about they gave me some clips from various movies to look at. And uh, everything from um, Silent Witness through to House through to a, a number of other ones. And I would have to say that they don't get it right in any way, shape <laughs> or form. <laughs> I mean, they're... they're a number of them, to be honest, were utterly laughable. The first film they showed me was an extract for, of S Agent Sparrow, the FBI agent, doing a post-mortem in Silence of the Lamb. So she's a, here's a cop doing a post-mortem. Okay, this is a good start. And then someone says to me, you know, you've got really beautiful eyes. And I would have to say that despite 23,000 post-mortems and lots of opportunity, nobody has ever said that to me in a post-mortem room. <laughs> I sort of feel, you know, my life has got a gap in it, but never mind. There we are. Oh, well. Have you had any spooky occurrences when you're doing one, like lights going <laughs> no. off or doors closing? No, no, nothing, like that. no nothing, nothing spooky. I'm afraid I'm, I'm very resistant. My family are convinced we have ghosts in the house, and I'm absolutely convinced we don't. Uh, so maybe I'm just, just not receptive to these things. Maybe, maybe. So I was going to ask you, because at the start I mentioned that you've been involved in some of the more recent notorious tragedies as far as the past couple of decades, it mentions that you had some involvement with regards to the, the Hungerford, uh, Hungerford massacre, should I say. I say involvement, to be clear, this is uh, clinically. So this was a shooting spree in Hungerford in August, I believe, 1987. Yeah. The, the perpetrator yeah. was a, a Michael Ryan who shot dead a number of people using using guns. What was your involvement with regards to that particular case? I was the, I had really just been appointed by then at Guy's for a couple of years, I suppose. Uh, and I was the, my boss, Ian West had gone away on holiday uh, and I was the pathologist on call. And at that time we covered everything. We covered up to Oxford and Banbury in the North, down to the South Coast, out the West, to Hungerford and among other places. So we covered a huge geographical area of the United Kingdom on call for the police to deal with cases such as this. So as the on-call pathologist, well, actually as the only pathologist at that point, because Ian was away, uh, I got the call to say that they had, I think the phraseology they use is, we've got a bit of an incident out in Hungerford typical police uh, downplaying things. He'd murdered 13 people, um, killed injured another 13 and then shot himself. 
I have to say that the significance of this was because I, if I got it right, you weren't even born then. Right? Was it 1989 you were born? Yeah, so this is yeah. a couple so, of years see, I, And I have to say, people go, well, I don't know, don't know about Hunkerford. We have to think of the, the recent shootings in Buffalo in America and the school shootings in America that we now sadly hear so often, these so-called spree shootings where someone with a gun goes off and kills a lot of people at one time. They're different from serial killers who kill one person at a time over a long period. So these are spree killings. We'd never had one in the United Kingdom. It, it, it had never, ever happened before. And then this man called Michael Ryan, for whatever reason, in this tiny little sleepy town of Hungerford out in Berkshire, suddenly went off and killed all these people. And I was the pathologist involved. And I went out to the town that night to examine Michael Ryan as he sat in this school classroom, a school that he'd actually attended. Uh, and he retreated there, obviously, as police began to close in on him. He'd retreated to an upstairs classroom and they I was called to the scene because the police he told the police at one point he had a bomb strapped to his body and if they moved him it would it would go up. So the police wanted someone to go in and confirm that he had actually shot himself rather than being shot because the rumours were the SAS had come in and they'd used a, a, a sniper to kill him and the police were very keen to establish that wasn't the case. Uh, and so they wanted someone to go and examine him in the classroom with this bomb. So uh, <laughs> they, they said, yeah, we, we, we don't, if we move him, Doc, and he blows up, we really want to be sure what's going on. So I was, <laughs> I was sent in on my own into this classroom to examine this guy just to check that he had actually shot himself. And that was a very, uh, you know, bit of a bit of a scary experience walking across a room to a man who was immobile but had a gun in his lap pointing across the room to me uh, um, but I was able to establish that he had shot himself uh, and then the next two or three days we performed post-mortems on him and on all the other victims uh, of that particular massacre. Is there any kind of conscience shift when you're doing a post-mortem on a victim of a shooting or a murder such as that versus doing one on an actual perpetrator? Uh, no I don't think so i've i've often asked myself because i've i've seen you know over my career i've seen a number of people who for one reason or another have died soon after committing awful murders when i perform a post mortem i have to move into professional mode because i'm an evidence gatherer i'm an evidence documenter i'm performing processes that are so important for the criminal justice system and for the coronial system because at some point in the future someone is going to ask me well where was that injury what sort of injury was it how big was it what was it caused by i can't at any point allow my sadness for the victims or my anger at a perpetrator to get in the way of my doing the best job that i possibly can whenever I perform a post-mortem. You know, even forgetting the need to respect and give a decent response to a dead person. I have to work for those things and I have to switch off those personal sensations uh, and get on with my job and do it to the best of my ability. What sort of preparation do you have to put in when you know you're going to be summoned to court as a, you know, well, a medical witness, I suppose? It depends very much, actually, Stuart, on, on the case itself. A long time ago, now I performed a post-mortem examination on a, on a lady who had been suffocated by uh, the Metropolitan Police and the Customs and Excise trying to deport her. And this lady was technically an illegal immigrant uh, and the police attended with Customs and Excise and they wound a length of tape around this lady's head and they suffocated her to death and police officers were prosecuted for her manslaughter and that was a highly complex highly difficult case as was the case of Stephen Lawrence as were a number of other cases and the preparation for those is intense and quite prolonged to be sure that you can give the accurate evidence 
to the court. And that's the role of the pathologist. I'm not there to convict. I'm not there to just stick to what I've been told because further evidence has been gained, no doubt, in, a, in the investigation that continued after my post-mortem. So I'm there to give the best evidence I can to the court and it can involve learning most of the information in two or three A4 ring binders so that I can be quick, accurate and precise when I'm talking to the jury because the jury are the people I need to get to understand what's going on, not the barristers. You know, they're, they're playing legal games usually. It's the jury they have to understand and they will have no prior knowledge of forensic medicine or medicine. So I have to try and convey complex medical detail, but in a way that a member of the general public can understand, but also without being condescending. Uh, and that can be quite difficult to achieve <laughs> at times. Yeah, but that's quite a hard balance to... Yeah, it, 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 but it, it is interesting to do it and, and it's very satisfying when you realise that the jury are understanding the subtleties of what you're conveying to them. It is nice to know that whatever their decision, they at least understand what the medicine and the pathology is. What was your relationship like with police officers for the most part? Did you ever have circumstances where they think, oh, I know what the cause of death is, I just need it to confirm it, and you're saying, actually, I need to go through the full process here. Did you find any concerns with regards to some police officers being more militant than others no i i, I even in highly contentious cases i i what what they were like out of my company of course i simply can't say but i've i've, I've always found the people that i've worked with very willing to understand they they have an appreciation for the job that i'm trying to do uh, and have never sort of said, oh, come on, doc, you know, he's been stabbed 10 times. Of course, the cause of death is, is, yeah. is stab wounds, uh, you know, because generally speaking, they know that I'm the job I'm doing is a bit more complicated than simply counting holes or counting bruises. And they know that eventually they're going to have to rely on my evidence uh, when we get to court. So I would have to say that, you know, some police officers are brighter than others. Some are more chatty than others. You know, they're, they're, they're human beings um, after all. But I've never had a, a real difficulty with someone saying, oh, come on, doc, just get on with it. Uh, you know, if that's what they've been thinking, <laughs> they wouldn't dare say it to my face, I think is probably the truth. <laughs> and I understand you had some involvement in the Princess Diana trial, which is obviously a very, very well-known case. What was your involvement with that one? A colleague of mine was the pathologist on call the weekend that the accident happened in Paris uh, and that Dodie and Diana were brought back to England and he performed their post-mortem examinations and established the cause of death. Some time later, uh, a few years later, when the, 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 the rumours and the conspiracy theories wouldn't go away and con continued not to go away. And in fact, we're gaining sort of credence in some areas. John Stevens, later Lord Stevens, who was the then commissioner of the Metropolitan Police, uh, was asked or decided to set up a complete re-examination of the death and the accident in the Alma Tunnel. Uh, and I was asked to be, because I'd had no prior involvement, I was asked to be the expert forensic pathology advisor to this investigation. And that was a, a fascinating time watching a really high powered, skilled set of detectives go about examining the minutiae, really the <laughs> tiny, tiny minutiae of this death. And you know, my evidence related to the car the incident uh, and the death of uh, both Dodie and Diana and trying to understand uh, what had happened uh, with that. But that's coming in, looking at photographs, looking at documents, going and examining things, uh, going over to Paris and talking to the pathologist who performed the first post-mortem on uh, a man called Henri Paul, who was the driver of the vehicle, but had also examined uh, Princess Diana in hospital after she died and expressed some views there. 
I understand you had some involvement regarding the 9-11 case as well. <laughs> yes, yes, it was busy times. Mm. Uh, yeah, it, 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 9-11 was uh, such a moment. You know, once again, I find when I'm lecturing now, I, I talk to <laughs> medical students and say, of course, there was 9-11 uh, and 2001. And I look around the room and realize that most of them weren't born in 2000, <laughs> 2001. That is depressing. And although they've you know, vaguely heard of this event occurring in a bit like Hungerford, you know, th th for me, absolutely seismic events that shockwaves traveled up and down the country. 9-11, the shockwaves traveled round and round the world. And yet they look a bit blank and go, oh, yes, it was a bit of a terrorist act. It was the most phenomenal terrorist action. You know, wh whatever one thinks there was a, you know, to plan that, to put it together required some incredible planning. And 3,000 people died, so I can't admire the planning. However, it was quite spectacular and it was meant to be. And because when English citizens die abroad and their bodies are returned to the United Kingdom for burial, they have to pass through the coronial system. Uh, and the coroner for West London, a lady called Alison Thompson at that time, and the Metropolitan Police and I were very concerned that clearly there were English fatalities, British fatalities in the two towers in New York. Um, we really wanted to make sure that any return of uh, bodies to England for burial wasn't held up by legal processes. And so I was sent out to New York to see what was happening, to see what was going on, to see how uh, it was uh, that the process was being performed in New York. Uh, the office of the medical examiner in New York, he, he, a medical examiner over there is the same as a sort of part coroner, part forensic pathologist, but they were the guys doing the work. And I have friends all around the world, uh, and lots of my friends were working in New York assisting. Uh, and so I was able to get in, see what was going on, and to advise the coroner, the police, and the government that, you know, any bodies returned from the medical examiner's office in New York, if they said it was John Smith, it was John Smith. Their processes were good, accurate and precise and their reports uh, and their comments could be relied on and i think hopefully we eased those passages for the the few british people who were actually identified and returned because although three people have died about give or take about 1400 people from those events have never been identified 1400 people are still unidentified from the crash and the collapse of those buildings. Amazing, distressing uh, situation that those families must still go through even at 20 something years post event. It's unbelievable. I think it's one of those generational events, especially for my generation where everyone remembers where they were when yes. the news broke of those attacks. Do you think it, we should be worried though that people who were either too young to remember it or were born just after, are almost desensitized now because of the volume of attacks we're seeing on a regular basis. Even the other day, there was the, the guy who shot a load of people in a convenience store in America. In Buffalo, yes, so, yeah, that, that's right. This, that was just, you know, another spree killing. I mean, in England, I think whatever one thinks about nanny states, we are so restrictive on the use of guns which is why so few events, shooting fatalities occur in this country. And you know, I, I'm not a shooter and there are possibly people who would disagree with me, but you know, I, every day, I thank goodness that you know, we have these restrictive laws. Some of them were brought in post Hungerford about rifles that could repeatedly fire. Some handgun rules were brought in post Dunblane, which you may remember was when a man entered a junior school in Dunblane in Scotland and shot dead a large number of children and restrictions on handguns were brought in after that. So we are, we in England, Wales and Scotland and Ireland live in very safe environment because of those things. But yes, there is a risk of desensitization. I, I think perhaps we all feel it a bit 
with the war in Ukraine. You know, the, the, there is that sensation, if we're not careful, of just another bombing. And it never is for the families. And I've spent my career focusing, I hope, significantly, not just on catching the guilty, but also on supporting the families who are innocent in every way in these circumstances, dealing with a tragic death, whether it's a, a fall from a building site or a road traffic accident or a drug overdose or whatever. They all need support and care to begin their grieving process. Absolutely. I think the work you've done is it's incredible. It's amazing. What I would like to ask, though, because it can't be easy doing that, especially with the volume of bodies you've had to look at, what effects mentally has doing your job had on you? <laughs> well, until 2016, Stuart, I would have said that I'm a, a, a roughy tufty and I've, you know, I prepared myself for it and I was, it didn't bother me. I, I did notice that when, whenever, and we, they, I've had to deal with a number of mass disasters, my 9-11 and we had the Marchioness and we had the Clapham train crash and you know, I could list a number. But I always noticed in, in those days, I will confess to having been a smoker, but my, so my cigarette consumption and my alcohol consumption would blip up for a period of time under the stress and the strain of dealing with those and then drop down again. And I would say I have now stopped smoking and I wouldn't condone anyone smoking anything in any way, shape or form <laughs> quickly. I, I will pass quickly over the possibility of the occasional whiskey and soda. But if I, until 2016, I, I thought that I was pretty immune until a sudden event just my world, it was literally like a trapdoor into Hades opening beneath my feet. And I suddenly had all of the memories of world trade, all of the memories of Hungerford, all of the memories of cases that I dealt with. Just, I just, I could no longer keep them contained. And I, I fell in an afternoon from, from being what I thought was perfectly normal in the morning, fell into the, a terrible state of anxiety and depression. And needed professional help from my colleagues and support from my family to get through it and I'm, I'm very pleased to say both were available and I took an antidepressant drug for a while and I had some uh, some therapy talking therapy with an absolutely wonderful lady who was the most marvelous person and I say I really was not keen to go to therapy but when I parked outside her house I saw that it was called Wits End, and I thought that was a very good name for a therapist. <laughs> and yeah. she was wonderful. And I'm pleased to say it's not not come back, but I am conscious now that when I look at my colleagues, uh, I say to them, you know, what are you doing? What? How are you looking after your mental health? And some of them are roughy tufty, some of them are being rather more proactive. I'm pleased to say, and being more caring of themselves and their colleagues. So. Yes, it did have an effect. Never thought it would, but uh, it did. But I'm very pleased to say that I'm I'm through it now, and uh, life is life is wonderful. I'm glad to hear it. I think we're in a world now, luckily, and it's getting better and better every day. Where it's okay, you know, they say it's okay to say you're not okay, whatever the yeah. terminology is yeah. now. People are seeking help now more and more, which is a great thing. And if it builds up and builds up and builds up, it has to come out at some point. And if, if you have an outlet that's positive, if you don't, then, you know, it could lead to disaster. Yes. I, I, but I think, you know, there, there clearly are some professions, uh, you know, paramedics, police, fire brigade, A&E staff, and I'm sure there are many more. So forgive me if I don't mention everyone, you know, who are exposed to traumatic events that they have to deal with, they have to manage. Uh, and, uh, you know, generally speaking, in those employed professions, uh, they will have the availability of psychological support available to them. And that really is something that if it is there and, you know, people are finding their jobs traumatic, if it's there, go and talk to someone. You know, you never know. You get a free cup of tea and a couple of biscuits. If nothing else, just go and talk to someone because, you know, it, it is so important to express your thoughts and feelings in a safe environment. So when did you actually retire? Well, <laughs> on the principle that my wife may not listen to this podcast, I'm ashamed, 
Uh, I would say 2017. She would say, I've never retired. I'm still doing, uh, still writing books. I'm still advising now mainly the defence, but not always. I'm involved in a couple of management reviews of a couple of mass disasters, some of them many decades ago that are still going on. Families are still very distressed. And once again, I feel for those families, we need to still look at them again. So I'm still working forensic pathologically uh, less and less. Uh, I'm uh, enjoying now my bees and my flying uh, and the sunshine and walking my dogs. So uh, if not quite retired, then reduced. Yeah. What was your transition like from just being a, a full-time pathologist to becoming a published author then? Is, is that something you always wanted to do? Well, I'm not, not yes, yes and no, if, if um, Stuart. A number of my predecessors have published books and they've always been along, I say a bit rudely, the Ernie Wise form of autobiography. You know, is 25 cases what I've done. And with no huge link through them, I always wanted to write something that was perhaps a little more introspective about what, how I had felt and perhaps how I had processed these things, but what, how it had affected me as well and how I felt that uh, other people had been involved. So, you know, when I wrote Unnatural Causes, it was very important that we looked at those aspects of my life too. Uh, and, and I talk in Unnatural Causes about the effect it had on my first marriage. Seven Ages of Death, much the same, looking at how I managed to deal with deaths at all ages, from babies to children to teenagers to adults to old, old people, looking through those stages of life and how I cope with managing those differences and how, but also looking back and saying the human body is a fantastic thing. But it, in our life, it changes and alters and the bits of it that are going to kill us also change and alter uh, and how we how we get killed changes and alters. So the seven ages looks looks at that progression. But just moving on and you know, looking at my own mortality now, I'm 70 in a couple of months time, you know, and three score years and 10 is up. Uh, you know, hmm, there's the thought to sort of quiet you in the evenings. <laughs> absolutely so let's let's transition to your bees I'm, I'm desperate to learn about your bees how did you get into beekeeping well it was something that i'd always wanted to do it always fascinated me managing these colonies these hives uh, and that retiring gave me that opportunity so i i joined a local bee keep, beekeeping association had some lessons uh, and now as I look out of the window, it's a beautiful uh, May day. I can see the bees whizzing out in and out of the two hives that we've got uh, in the garden just below me. So that they're busy off collecting nectar for me, uh, which hopefully will go into jars later on in the year and we'll be able to enjoy throughout the winter. It's fascinating. They, they are amazing behaviours of these groups, you know, with one queen and the female workers and the drones who the males who do bugger all uh, just <laughs> sit around but on the other hand when winter comes they're the first ones that get the chop and get thrown out of the hive uh, right. to die so it, it is amazing these organisms how they work together how they survive it is truly amazing do you sell the honey or do you just use that for no I, I, I don't I, I give it away uh, to friends actually it doesn't I come to think but I don't give it away it seems to disappear from uh. the spot, uh, <laughs> when friends and family come around there are there are legal requirements you know in terms of labeling or whatever if you're going to sell it uh, okay. and I've to be honest, I've never had enough at the end of friends and family come to visit me to make it worthwhile it, it would be nice to to get it but it's done for enjoyment rather than profit. Yeah. Is it quite hard to get into or is it a fairly open entry level? No, no, no. It, it's very easy. Uh, you know, anyone who's interested, look up your beekeeping association. There's a the British Beekeeping Association. They'll give you names and addresses of your uh, local branch. Go along and have their, you know, introductory lessons. Uh, they're usually um, beginning of the year, sort of February, March time, so that you can get a hive at the start of the beekeeping year, which is March, April, uh, and then follow it through and enjoy 
the honey at the end of the year. It is rather nice, I have to say, having a honey sandwich in December when it's cold and remembering the sunny days. And as I say, I, I can see hundreds of bees at the minute whizzing around, uh, happy as Larry, diving in and flying out of the hives. It's tremendous. You get many stings. Uh, occasionally, yeah, just just a few. But I'm afraid, you know, life life is like that, isn't it? it, it you is. wouldn't you wouldn't perhaps appreciate it quite as much if you didn't have the occasional setback and sting. Of course. And you've had your private pilot license since 2004. So the aviation has always been something you've had a fascination with. Absolutely. I, I started that actually a long time ago. I st I learned to fly when I was still working in and around London. That is just such a marvellous thing to do. Uh, belonging to a group is not expensive in terms of you know annual pay, annual contributions or hourly rates, and the plane is shared between sort of ten or fifteen people. It, it to take off and to fly in the sky and just be completely free it, is absolutely tremendous, and it's got me right the way down to uh, nearly into Geneva in switzerland see my relatives who live in france i've flown all over the united kingdom flying up to scotland and to, down to the south is tremendous down to channel islands it just huge pleasure in the organization in the planning in the doing and in the remembering and it's an absolutely marvelous you know it's a great way of taking your mind off the day-to-day -day irritations in life any other hobbies i'm started learning to mend clocks now this mm. is pre-planning because i reckon that i needed a hobby that was a bit practical and a bit thoughtful but one that i could do when my arthritis finally nailed me to a chair <laughs> so i <laughs> so I'm, I'm trying to do a a course with the british horological institute but i'm, I'm failing miserably because i'm afraid real work keeps getting in the way but i've got couple of nice grandfather clocks ticking away i've got clocks ticking in my office uh, and i've just looking i've just dismantled a very nice looking little carriage clock that's going to be my wife's uh, anniversary present in september so that's uh, you know, wonderful great enjoyment great pleasures new things to learn always new things to learn and i think that's that's important absolutely was that kind of a a tip maybe to people not just in forensic pathology but people who are working and the struggling with the mental side and the needed outlet I, th I think it's crucial to have at least one hobby that you can do just to take your mind off even watching movies listening to music whatever it may be it's important to have something absolutely you know, I, I i don't play golf but you know i can i can see that you know the benefits of that you know, and just just something just that you can focus on that takes your mind away from the hassles of day to day jobs and day to day life. You know, it, it is really to lose yourself in it is wonderful. Cool. So I do have some listener questions for you. I put a post on social media yesterday and I said, does anyone have a question for a forensic pathologist? And I got a couple of responses, which is well, better than the than zero that I normally get. So we've got a couple of questions. The first one, now this apparently is an ex-colleague of yours, someone called Pam. <laughs> yes, hello, Pam. Who you'll probably know. <laughs> yes. Pam has a few questions for you, three, in fact. The first one, who do you think is a good replacement for you in the pathology world? Ooh. I honestly don't think I can answer that question. Got I name mean, drop. Uh, no, I mean, I, I'm, I have to say now there are, when I started, we, it was a little bit Wild Westy, not just Ian West as a colleague, but, you know, we, 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 we were sort of launched off into there. Now they have much more training and a bit more controlled. But, you know, th there are lots, lots and lots of people who are interested, who are really good and who know much more than I ever did. So I, I, I think... When you leave a profession like this, I, I think you really shouldn't look back and say, oh, that's not not how I would have done it. I'd have yeah. done it. You know, uh, you, you, they, these are big boys and girls, great people, nice, nice to spend time with. And I love listening to their stories, but I, I really wouldn't pick any out of the group that are there. So the next question also from Pam is, is the next leg of your tour the same as the last one? So I think she went to 
your most recent book came out in September, I yes. believe. You did a tour. Now, she wants to know, is the next tour you're doing the same as before? Because now it's out in paperback, I guess. Yeah, well, the new book, Seven Ages, yeah, the and the tour is starting on the 12th of October in Stafford. Uh, and the details are going to be on my website very soon. Uh, and it's all different. I don't, as I'm looking down the list here, we actually get to the West End, the Duchess Theatre, Monday the 31st of October, Hallow's Eve, that'll be fun. No, all different theatres, and it's a completely different show this time round. So those that came last time can come and see it again. It'll be twice as exciting this year. <laughs> we've got, I, I can't tell you because I can't count quickly enough, but we've got a lot of venues between the 12th of October and the 11th of November. Uh, I do have a day or two off, but we go Burnley, Buxton, Swansea, Birmingham, Dunstable, Winchester, Nottingham, Bournemouth, all the high points. And we end at the Mercury Theatre in Colchester on Friday, the 11th of November. It'd be great fun. I really enjoyed doing the tour last year. I was very, very, very wary and worried by it. But it was, I love the audience uh, participation and joining in. And, you know, hopefully we talked about a few things that were interesting and we discussed the case and we had um, if those of you people who came we had a surprise guest on stage uh, that caused a few gasps so that was that was fun are you coming anywhere near leeds let's have a little look yes <laughs> friday 14th of october leeds Ooh. city varieties although that's Ooh. not quite how it's spelt on the piece of paper <laughs> i'm looking at friday 14th of october in leeds so come come and see us Stuart. it'd be great oh, great to meet you I might have to do that. Yeah, I, I think you really ought to. And bring along a group of about 40 or 50, please. <laughs> I don't think I know that many people to <laughs> No, I didn't say you had to know them. I just said bring them along. <laughs> I just bring them. <laughs> the third and final question from Pam is, she said, what is the best cause of death you've seen? Now, let's rephrase that and say the most interesting, the most unique rather oh, than best. Gosh. I don't know. I mean, I think having seen so many... All of them are without hesitation, utterly tragic. But there are some situations, possibly, where, you know, you go, and what did you expect to happen when you started doing X? And, you know, just you just you just wonder why people do very, very, very silly things at times. And so I can't really think of one that is best or unique i i know there was a man who was trying to escape london he was trying to avoid something in london and he managed to get himself into a gap between buildings uh, he fell into it uh sort of parkour running and this was a space that he couldn't get out of and that was really sad so no i can't can't think of anything anything particular but just to say that sometimes you wonder what people were on earth thinking about when they decided to go nude swimming in the sea on New Year's Day in the middle of a storm. It was never going to end well. Yeah. So the second, well, not the second question, but the second questionnaire, as it were, a friend of mine, Lorraine, from another podcast, American Murder Stories, she says, which postmortem has stuck with you the most? So this could be most memorable, the one that's affected you, maybe someone that was young, perhaps. It's I can remember a lot of them actually, not not in a, a worrying way. And every postmortem is different, and every postmortem is special in the sense that they are each one is is and must be and has to be unique uh, and focused. I think. I think the one that sticks with me oddly, and I, I really can't be sure why, is someone who committed suicide by jumping off a, a car, a multi-story car park. Now, why? I mean, in the sense, it's sad, it's not unique, but when we looked in the car park, you could see the footprints through the dirt in the car park. You could see the footprints on the edge of the balcony where they stood, and the twist and turn of that footprint as they turned around and jumped. And the injuries as they landed were unique and different. That, that that's, that, I, I don't, don't know why that stuck with me, but that one, that one has. Wow. Not a, you know, not a murder, just a really, mm. really, really sad 
depressed person. And I guess, you know, having been down the depression line, it also rings a bell with me because there were moments I can remember just jumping back a bit, my my mental health nurse who was looking after me, you know, popping in every day just to see how I was catching on. He said, you know, the, the one thing that worries about me, about you, Richard, is that when I see a lot of people who talk about killing themselves. You know how to do it. And I thought, oh, gosh, that, that's really quite worrying. Yes, that's true. Yeah. Wow. I've got another question here from Jenny from It's Murder Up. It's murder up north, should I say, another podcast. The strangest case you've encountered, what might that be? Well, the strangest case. I mean, I, there are lots. Each case can be strange in its own way. And I, I talk about, I have talked about this case, and I talk about it again in The Seven Ages of Death. It's the death of Gareth Williams, the man from GCHQ in London, who was found in a bag in his locked flat in London. Uh, and a lot of people have written a lot of words about it, and I find it completely fascinating um, what went on, why it went on, uh, and how it went on. Uh, and that death has challenged me because a lot of people say he's clearly been murdered. Uh, and I stand up and say, no, I don't think so. This is not a murder. This is an accidental death. And that's, so that's challenged me, made me think, made me look at my own thoughts, my own skills, my own experiences, and come back to the conclusions that I've I've reached. So he is tragically fascinating death of a very, very bright young man who did something uh, and died as a result. The next question is from Bobby, a, a frequent collaborator of mine from Killer Stories podcast. I think Bobby is a dental hygienist. Uh -huh. Apologies if I've got that wrong, Bobby. I should know. Um, she wants to know how are dental records used to identify bodies? Right. Well, dental records are really important. When we, when we have uh, an individual that identification is in doubt, I mean, normally, of course, you, you, we will find a relative who will come in and who will visually identify. Yeah, that's my dad or my brother or my work colleague or whatever, because they've known them, they've seen them. And, and we work on faces usually because faces are all individual. They're all different. And that's what we're looking for with fingerprints and with dental records. Uh, so dental records can be used, but we, they need to be unique. They need to be different. And we need to have that charting that your dentist has done to show you've had a filling here and the type of filling and when it was done and when there's decay and when there's a gap and when you've had a crown, all of these things are different. And we're looking for differences in fingerprints, uniqueness in teeth. You know, I've got daughters and I say, go and play rugby, you know, get some teeth knocked out. You're going to be 32 perfect teeth for all of you. That's no, <laughs> no good at all. Go and do something <laughs> to make them different. Uh, they don't, I'm very pleased to say, but uh, you know, it is the differences that we're looking for between you, me and everyone else. And we need the anti-mortem records, the charting from your dentist that we can then link to the teeth that we find in the body. And teeth are great because they last a long time. They're there. And if we have a dental record, we can make a really good positive identification. Fascinating stuff. The final question I've got from a listener is, again, most of these are just from my podcast friends, but this is Dawn from Scottish Murders, sort of a above the border sister show of British Murders, if you will. Dawn wants to know, is there anything you know now that you wish you would have known when you first started in pathology? Gosh, that's a really good question, Dawn. That's, I, I think the, the only thing that I wished I had known when I was younger is the ability to write reports that would keep me, keep me out of the the glare of the defence barrister. <laughs> you know, so, now I think you know as you as you get older and you've experienced difficult cross examinations in court because you have written something that's a bit wishy washy. Do you know? I mean, words like could and might be. Mm. You know, really can lead you in a difficult case, lead you into real complications and i've learned now towards the end of my career that you know you you try you know, you you as precise as you can be but if you start saying might be you realize that someone is going to question you about it and possibly 
quite rightly so. But you realise it, it just comes as a shock sometimes when it first happens and you go, well, I didn't didn't quite mean that, but you know, we're now in a court of law and challenges along those lines are quite right that they should occur, but quite right that you as a forensic pathologist should be ahead of the game and know that they're coming and know how to deal with them. So aside from brutal cross-examination, is there anything else that surprised you about forensic pathology? No, other than it's been the most fantastic career. And I'm so lucky to have found a career in my early teenage years, to have gone to medical school, to have learnt it, to have done it, to have enjoyed practically every minute of it for very nearly 40 years and to be still enjoying it now and to be challenged by it and to be learning from it. I really do think I'm such, such a lucky person. You've had a great career. Absolutely. And as a reminder to those, Richard's latest book, The Seven Ages of Death, is available to purchase now. I'm going to put a link in the description of this episode if you're interested in buying it. And of course, your tour starts in October. Did you say the 10th it starts? 12th of October, 12th. Stafford, but all the details will be on uh, my web page very soon. Which I'll also link in the episode description. Really appreciate you coming on, Richard. It's been an absolute pleasure speaking to you. Apart from the website and the tour, you're on some social medias, are you on Facebook, Twitter? No, Twitter. Twitter. I don't do Facebook, um, but I do tweet, tweet away. <laughs> Not a not a lot. I'm a, not a I'm not a massive tweeter. I'm afraid I tweet generally during the tours, in the lead up and over the tours about what we're doing. But uh, otherwise, I'm afraid I'm uh, not always not not a massive social media presence. But there's there's certainly stuff going on. Cool. Any final thoughts before we close out? No other, Stuart. Then thank you for inviting me onto your podcast. It's been real fun uh, a great pleasure talking to you and i hope that it's given sort of insight to uh, you know my my life and and work and as i say i just think i'm a i'm a very very lucky person absolutely it's been a pleasure having you on i uh, really appreciate you putting in the time i think a lot of my listeners including myself will appreciate the insight into the the forensic side and what actually happens because when you're looking into cases it's almost a throwaway sentence to say the postmortem confirmed the cause of death as X. And that's all you kind of really get when you're researching a case. So it's nice to actually see the ins and outs behind that one sentence to think, actually, what does go on? How have you come to that conclusion? So I appreciate you being so earnest with me. No, it, it, it's, it's, you know, a lot of, a lot of work can sometimes be summed up in that one. It's never, it's never a throwaway conclusion. It's always the basis of a lot of hard work when I did it. And certainly by my colleagues now, I know that's still, still the case. Cool. So that does it for this very special interview episode. Dr. Richard Shepard, thank you again for coming on. And for the rest of you, I will see you all next week. <laughs>